In the context of a collaboration with the Bilderfaz Jörg Research Network, Martin Westwood and I were invited to visit the Warburg House in Hamburg with the aim of proposing a possible intervention there. This presentation will discuss a particular line of thought that was taken away from the visit and how this is being developed in the form of a colloquium event envisaged to take place at the Warburg House in June of next year. A brief history of the Warburg House is that it opened in 1926 under the name of the Culture Wissenschaft Lich Bibliothek Warburg, which I'm going to call the KBW. And it's actually known as the KBW General. And it was built on a plot next to Warburg's home in Hamburg. His house had evolved into an institute under Fritz Saxel and Gertrude Bing's leadership during Warburg's illness from 1921 to 24. The KBW was thus the site where the Limousin Atlas was produced from 1927 and links the material used for his famous Herziana Library Lecture of 1929 in Rome. 1929 was also the year of Warburg's death. When Fritz Saxel undertook the successful migration of the contents of the KBW to London in 1933, as he rightly perceived that the Nazi regime represented an increasing threat to the KBW's existence. Thus, the active history of the building is just some seven years, and only two to three years during Warburg's own lifetime. In 1993, the building was acquired by the city of Hamburg, who renovated the building due to the damage and the state of disrepair it had fallen into. Most of the original fittings of the KBW are long gone, but a series of photographs from the KBW's early years serves as a record documenting the fact that it was much more than a library and a reading room, and points to it being a complex apparatus serving the production of the panels that make up the atlas. It also points to a methodology submerged in Warburg's relationship to photographic media, dating from at least 1907. Panels for exhibitions were regularly produced, uh, but the atlas seems to mark a distinctive moment in Warburg's relationship to photo media. The early 1900s is, is significant as Warburg bases himself in his home city of Hamburg from 1902. He lived in Florence between 1898 and 1902, where the primary sources for his studies in the early Renaissance were uh, early Renaissance were, were obviously highly abundant. Of course, his choice of returning to Hamburg could have been simply because it was his family's city, but equally, it was an excellent choice for a scholar who was consciously choosing to base himself within secondary and documentary sources for his research. It was not until 1919 that the University of Hamburg was founded, and thus Hamburg was far from being the natural choice of, um, of a base for a scholar of the Renaissance especially one who had such extensive material means at his disposal. Spoliation is possibly a way of thinking Warburg's relationship to secondary sources through and begins to highlight the installation of a highly complex reprographic technical apparatus and in parallel to the library that numbered 60,000 books when it was shipped to London in the 30s. Warburg's favouring the second-order material was also due to his engagement with panoramic time frames across a uh, vast geographic space rather than generational and relatively localised stylistic influences that tended to dominate the discipline of art history at the time. The KBW is known in most part from iconic images of the reading room taken in the first few years of the library's existence. In such uh, terms, uh, the Getty image is, uh, is, is typical. The perspective is towards the entrance with bookshelves to each side, above which are projectors and a shelving system, possibly for journals and slides. Tables are arranged around the space underneath a partial view of a distinctive oval ceiling window. Other views of the reading room document its use as a means to display exhibition panels against the bookcase that seem to be especially designed for this purpose. Both images highlight the reading room's utility as a library, space of slide presentation and exhibition. The less reproduced image shows the reading room's other side. A small curtain proscenium has a lectern in front of it, an oblong wooden strip on the floor, running counter to the floorboards. I'm not sure it's actually 
very visible here, conceals a screen. There it is. Polysystem operated and revealed the screen. Above the proscenium seems to be a support, which could also possibly act as a screen. The oval ceiling window, with its lights orbiting the ellipse, possibly a reference to Leibniz's design of the library at Wolfenbüttel, that used a Kepler ellipse as the shape of its central plan, is more visible in this image. This image is taken from the mezzanine and shows how the room's space echoes the oval shape of the elliptical ceiling formation. Other documentary images from the 1920s show the roof space above the oval window. I'm all right, I'm tall. Elaborated mechanical screening setup controls the light in the reason room. And this is automated by means of a motorised winch. The projectors are visible in the most circulating images of the reason room, but their identity is difficult to ascertain. Another image reveals there are two, possibly three projectors. Two sort of circular forms at the rear suggest two slide projectors for different formats, uh, glass slides. The large machine at the front of the apparatus is, is actually an overhead projector. This is in 1926, by the way. Uh, thus, the projectors could display transparencies and hard copy images, most probably from books and prints. The projectors, and especially the overhead projector, date from at least 1926, but their robustness is demonstrated by an image of one of several homes the Warburg occupied in London before its present location. This image is from Thames House in Millbank site and shows the same projectors being operational after 1933. Plans of the KBW indicate where it is known there was a photographic studio situated on the lower ground floor and below the reading. <coughs> this elevation, probably by Fritz uh, Schumacher, precedes the final version of the house that uh, Gerhard Langmark signed off. When the KBW moved to London, literally everything was dispatched. This included several medium and large format class plate cameras and enlargers. The supposition is that the studio would have been used for copying, resizing, and developing images in the darkroom. It can be concluded that these were the contents of the KBW's photo studio. The yellow bit is, this actually doesn't correspond to the actual plan, but it, there was the reading room, and underneath there was very much this, um, um, this photo studio. Other plans, although again not definitive, indicate a dumb waiter system that was installed in the house but did not survive the years between 1933 and the renovation. Images of the house clearly indicate its presence. It's the cupboard thing between the door and the stairs there. Its use is evident from a further image. Books were transported between floors, and the tray on the lower section of the lift suggests that documents and photographs were also transported by this means. The telephone to the left of the dumbwaiter is, more, uh, is one of more than 20 in the house, serving as much as an internal communication system as a link to the outside world. As can be seen from this image, the dumbwaiter hasn't survived. Further image. Uh, shows an office area. Again, a telephone is present and a control panel, possibly for internal communication. Also present is a pneumatic tube system, again for sending documents around the KBW. Such systems were common in stores and banks from the mid-19th century onwards. An image of Fritz Saxel shows that there was a large safe presumably for storing valuable books, it was installed in the ground floor office. All of these details point to the KBW being a highly technically sophisticated structure by 1926 standards. The communication system points to an administrative apparatus, uh, much like that of a bureaucratic complex. With Warburg's family background in mind, of course, a bank comes to mind. Photographic studio points 
to a use of reprographic means that goes beyond what a library would normally accommodate. Integration of the photo studio into the KVW doesn't mark the beginning of working with photographic means. The photo boards were used from at least 1907 onwards for exhibition and display purposes. The KVW reading room is synonymous with the production of the Nimison Atlas, its sources date from 1924, before the construction of the KVW began, and continuing after Warburg's death in 1929. KBW's apparatus confirmed that a reprographic methodology was fully integrated into the KBW's design and the reading room fun functioned as a polyvalent space as a library reading room, a lecture theatre, a photographic studio, most probably a space of montage. The production of the Atlas brings the KBW into focus in a very particular way. What survived of it are photographs of 79 panels. The images of each panel were, uh, were taken in the reading room itself and in exactly the same position. Uh, this is established by the books visible to the left and above the panel and the bolt of the reading, room, uh, reading room's door visible to its right. The question of how many panels were actually used is interesting. Panels were assembled to be photographed and not to be displayed. There certainly were, were not 79 panels. Uh, used, but perhaps as few as one or four. The panels were thus assembled, photographed, and then disassembled, and ready for the next montage. Um, Taffel, Bald, 76, points to an interesting aspect of, this material, of the material composition of the panels. Uh, to the middle right, over here, are two identical images. They're a detail of an illustration by Jacobus Villanus, uh, except that one is reversed. They're actually... Because that one there, that one there, <clears throat> this tiny detail demonstrates that a photograph, of, um, a photograph of a detail of the image had been made, and the slide reversed to achieve the second image. Interest, interesting here, that it, is that some images are simply photographic prints and other, others are mounted using corner fixes. This is kind of Mary Louise thing here. All the mounted images are in the Warburg Archive in London. The rest are subsumed into the wider photographic collection. The point here is the process, process of assembling the boards involved a complexity in terms of the selection of images and their ultimate materialisation. Photo studios seem to play a crucial role in this process to the extent that a large part of the 900 odd images that make up the Atlas were produced solely for this purpose and were not part of a standing archive. The mounted images seem to represent this production. Ian Jones from the Warburg in London, who directs the photographic resources at the Institute, suggests that the quality of the images produced for the boards was, was provisional and only served their function as material for a published document and not as exhibition material. In this way, their production is akin to a paste-up publishing process, where the aspect of montage is far from being one of just image selection, but is rather specific image production in terms of sizing, selection of details, and in the case here, reversing an image. Recognition of the complexity of the labour involved in producing the Taflin raises an interesting question about Warburg's specific position within the process. That the process was a methodology that involved extensive collaborations demonstrated by a series of panels produced in the 1940s, this is a long time after Warburg's death, and they're produced by Saxel, probably in collaboration with Whitgiver and with Otto Fine as technical assistants. They were made for exhibitions at the Court Hall of the National Gallery and concentrated on the relationship of British art and Mediterranean culture. When they were originally made, actually, it was English art and Mediterranean culture. The motivation here was certainly linked to the Warburg Institute's German identity as a refugee organisation based in London during the Second World War. The war panels clearly show that the photographic equipment was not just transported to London, 
but also that the working method was deeply in, embedded in the Institute's practices. Saxon and Fine were at the centre of this. An image uh, from the book of British Art on the Mediterranean by Saxon and Victor demonstrates the link between the production of the exhibition boards and the images in the book. The text structure resembles the succinct introductions Gertrude Bing wrote for the Atlas, where the text is narrated directly by the images through a series of numbered references, i.e. on the left there. It's always a brief intro, and then a series of numbered references which relate around the, the plates. I'm not sure if all, at all if the form of Saxon and Vickover's book is what the Atlas would have taken if it had been published in Warburg's lifetime, but it does give, give an indication of how montage is at the inception of the book's form, and that the images are not secondary, serving simply as illustrations of a continuous text. In some respects, the text of this book functions more as a script than an academic essay. The text narrates the images, and not vice versa. Wherever there's a major difference between the character of the Saxon and the of the boards and Warburg's Atlas, the Atlas is more speculative, arguably esoteric, and not really didactic in the way this one is. It does seem to be an object where Warburg's thinking is both uh, at work and is also represented. Four photographs taken in the hotel suite, which are quite well known, where Warburg stayed when he made his famous Sertziana Library Lecture in January 1929 in Rome, show a large board, very different in form from the earlier exhibition in Atlas boards that he was possibly using to prepare his lecture. Perhaps this demonstrates, uh, he's looking very grumpy there, isn't he? Perhaps this demonstrates the role of the photographic image and his thinking beyond simply being a means of presentation, but more as a way of constructing themes, motifs and connections as a means through which to think through ideas and juxtapositions. And we're gradually panning out here with these photographs. Here is where perhaps the historical importance of Warburg's method resides, at least in a way of prefiguring how forms of med uh, mediation potentially transform a discipline. The fourth image here pans out to a complete view uh, of the board. It's partially seen in the previous three images. Composition of this board seems more systematic. Perhaps it's an index tool from which successive panels are constructed. This sense of his methodology being linked to a complex technical apparatus asks more questions about how the atlas works and how specific lines of thought can be applied to successive technical modalities. In relation to this, are, num uh, uh, in relation to this are, are another series of curious connections. It's well known that Kenneth Clark attended Warburg's Herziana lecture in 1929, and the experience had a considerable influence on him. He was in Rome at that time assisting Bernard Berenson. When Saxon was seek seeking a safe haven for the KBW, Clark was instrumental in helping the cause. Even when it was installed in its, its series of temporary homes, Clark continued to give the Warburg his support during the war, helped many of its academics become British citizens. Clark, Clark was also involved in helping Saxon mount the British Art and Mediterranean exhibitions. It was in part a way of bringing the Warburg's activities to bear upon questions of British identity as part of the war effort. One of these exhibitions took place in 1943 at the National Gallery in London, and Clark was its director. What Clark obviously understood, and perhaps more than Warburg's deeper and more significant methodology, was the role of the image and montage in narrating historical spaces. The making of the BBC series Civilization was the ultimate expression of this, and it's comparable to Warburg's technical relationships with the KBW in terms of an art historian utilising a complex technical apparatus, in this case, courtesy of the BBC. Second order visual material takes precedence in civilization, even when Clark is seen before works of art in a multitude of locations. As pointed to earlier, it's possible to see how Saxon and Wittkopf's British art on the Mediterranean reads as much like a script or a montage than a standard academic text. Perhaps this serves as a model for Clark's television projects. 
This book was first published in 1948 and was successively republished as late as uh, 1969, which is the year civilization was first transmitted. From the perspective of 1969, it is living evidence of a method that links directly to Warburg's thinking. It also, it's also aptly the product of migration and transmission. The considerable impact of civilization was, of course, the transmission of a cultural narrative to a mass audience. In British terms, this was towards establishing a sense of an ideologically patriarchal cultural consensus. The ideological implications of civilization was a contested ground upon which uh, the polemic underpinning um, uh, was a contested ground upon, upon which the polemic underpinning John Berger's way, ways of seeing was constructed as a book, but most importantly here as a TV programme. Berger famously evokes Walter Benjamin's work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction as a background to the thinking behind the project. The English, the English translation of this essay dates back to 68, and Jonathan Cape's first published Illuminations and translation is in 1970. It can be assumed in this period that Warburg and his methods would have been known to a particular discipline, in a relatively small circle of people. The inner circle was comprised significantly of people who had actual contact with him, or the inner workings of the Institute. In short, Warburg was an obscure and esoteric figure in the early 1970s, and he does not seem to be a direct influence on Berger, or even on his radar. The book version of Ways of Seeing suggests the project's DNA was in many ways closer to Warburg than Benjamin's methodology. And in fact, Berger's response to civilization entailed questions arising from constructing discourses from within an image montage process rather than originating them from a textual source. It's of course possible to attempt situating Berger within a Benjaminian constellation. It's doubtful that Berger was accessing. Uh, much more than the translation of the text of the work of, um, of, the, work of the art in, a, in the age of mechanical reproduction at that time. <coughs> Actually, what seems to be more at work is an eng engrammatic transmission of the possibility of, visually based, uh, of a visually based iconographic method. The basis of this resides in the problematics presented by the medium of film and TV. I don't, I don't think it's, it's far-fetched to view ways of seeing as a residue of a Warburgian methodology that was ironically sparked his polemical confront, confrontation with Clark's broadcasting projects. This is actually Berger and uh, Clark on one of uh, Clark's much earlier ITA um, projects. As I write this presentation, I'm also compiling a range of images in PowerPoint often as a sequence or finding a new image will determine the trajectory of thought. Even, even as I write this, I'm aware of the technical sensorium that's work in its production. However, I do not possess the means of a banker's son, as Warburg did. I'm also not privileged to the image production apparatus and resources of an organisation like the BBC, as both Clark and Berger were. were. However, the facts uh, there have been successive transmission of modes of technical reproduction since Warburg does not render his relation to questions of montage methodology obsolete. I suppose workshop in Hamburg, that I mentioned at the outset of this presentation, will look to open up a series of questions that relate to aspects of the technical apparatus described here. The fundamental point here is perhaps one of how the technical apparatus facilitates and develops ways of thinking, and not how it simply serves to illustrate or present an already elaborated and concluded text. Thank you.